Okay. Uh, thank you very much for coming today. Um, um, I, I'm going to introduce myself because maybe a lot of people don't know me. I'm Aslam Anis, and I'm the director of the Center for Health Evaluation and Outcome Sciences. And it's going to be a great pleasure today to hear our guest speaker, and I'm going to introduce him in a second. But what I'd also like to acknowledge uh, right off the bat that uh, today's um, guest speaker was sponsored, and this, this, this uh, seminar today is co-sponsored by the BC CRIN, which is the British Columbia Clinical Infrastructure Research Network. Did I get that right? Uh, I've only been involved going to the meetings for two years now. Uh, and, um, and the Center for Clinical Epidemiology and Evaluation, which is at uh, Vancouver Hospital. And um, the three of us jointly uh, sponsored this event. And um, the director of the center of Clinical Epidemiology and Evaluation, um, Dr. Sterling Bryan, can't be with us today, but I believe he's with us on video, which you can't see. Um, but Jim, who's the medical officer for BC CRIN, is here, and I'd like to invite him to come here and say a few words about BC CRIN. Well, thanks, Aslam, and thank you for coming, and thank you uh, to our guests at other sites, uh, Vancouver, Victoria. Um, BC CRIN has celebrated its third anniversary just a few weeks ago. It's been busy and uh, developing uh, a vision to increase the quality, the quantity, and the funding for clinical research in British Columbia. Uh, the Director of Operations, Heather Harris, is here, and part of what we thought we needed to do, I took over a position as Chief uh, Medical Officer in November uh, and have engaged the clinical research community. And part of what we want to do is um, increase our capability in methodology in clinical research. And that methodology can apply to uh, cardiology, HIV, emergency medicine, any field. And uh, to that end, uh, we thought we should have a guest lecture series that uh, this is the first uh, to kick off this series. Um, I'm hoping this can be helpful. I'd love to hear your feedback if this was helpful. Uh, Jay Russell at bccrin.ca. Uh, and it's a real pleasure that uh, my friend and colleague uh, Aslam uh, has been joining forces with us. We really want to see this growth of clinical research in British Columbia working together. So it was uh, fantastic that we were able to plan this event together and uh, bring you all together and have a nice lunch and then hear our guest speaker. Uh, Aslam is going to give the detailed bio, but I, I met Roger at an NIH retreat trying to figure out why all sepsis trials have failed. And we had two days with academics, NIH, FDA, EMEA, uh, and Roger gave a talk on this uh, topic of adaptive trial design. I was really taken with it and I thought, uh, I'd love to see whether this is something we should be doing more in BC. I think it's a, it's a winner as a strategy, and so I'll let you judge for yourself, and I'll hand it back to Aslam to, to introduce our guest. Uh, thank you, Jim, and I, I think that we will have hopefully more um, invited speakers and sessions uh, that, that would be a partnership uh, with different groups uh, in the city, and um, we will also probably be a good idea to introduce people to more about the potential of BC CRIN collaborating with uh, CHAOS and C2E2 in, in, in increasing our capacity to do clinical trials in, in Vancouver. So it gives me great pleasure today to be able to introduce to you our speaker, Dr. Roger Lewis. Um, uh, Dr. Lewis has a PhD in physics and then he trained as a physician both at Stanford University and uh, then he started his academic career at UCLA and currently he heads uh, the emergency research um, group at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. And he's a very accomplished um, researcher, and especially given his area of adaptive clinical trials, which is, uh, brings in Bayesian methodology. I'm not going to say any more before I say something wrong, so I'm going to just hand it over to Roger. And Roger is going to speak for about an hour, and then he'll leave about half an hour for questions. And we'll have questions from the remote site as well as from here. So in about an hour, I'll come back here and moderate the question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much. So um, 
So the challenge here is to. Sorry. Yep, you're good. The challenge here is to speak for about an hour to a group that's just had lunch about statistics. Um, so what I want to do is try to paint for you a picture about a new way of thinking, a slightly new way of thinking about clinical trial design. And in the course of the description and describing a particular trial, encourage you to think about what you've been told about trial design, and I want you to leave the room thinking much of what you were taught was just wrong. That's my goal. So how many people here are statisticians? Oh, this may be a hostile audience. We'll see how this goes. OK. OK. But luckily, I'm only here for a day, so uh, I, can, I can escape. So um, financial disclosures, I work with lots of different people um, and entities, all in uh, adaptive clinical trial design. We're lucky enough, our group, to have support from both the NIH and the FDA to apply the kinds of techniques I'll be talking about today across a wide variety of clinical areas. Um, and also work with a number of, of commercial partners. So whenever one is in the position of designing a clinical trial, there's this period where you're trying to decide what dose of the medication to give, how to use the device, what your outcome ought to be, how soon you should give the in intervention, um, how long you should follow the patients until you measure the outcome, et cetera, et cetera. There's all these questions. And each one of them reflects an area of uncertainty. And because we don't know what the right answers are to all of those questions, there's uncertainty in what the best trial design is. And yet, traditionally, despite this uncertainty, which is often quite profound, we're taught that we need to make decisions about all of these characteristics, write them down in a protocol, and hold those characteristics fixed during trial execution. Otherwise, at the end, we'll have no idea what the data mean. And this leads to an increased risk of a negative or a failed trial. And I use the term failed trial to mean a trial where at the end you're actually not sure if it was positive or negative. It's sort of the ones that give you a, a hint of a signal and a p-value of 0.07. And you wonder, now what am I supposed to do? Okay. But it, this leads to an increased risk of a negative or failed trial, even if the treatment is inherently effective. So despite the fact that we have tremendous uncertainty in many of the decisions we make when we design a trial. We only act on that uncertainty at specific time points. So in drug development, we talk about phase one. That's the first use of the drug in humans, sometimes without the disease, sometimes with the disease in question, depending on the setting. Or in medical devices, we'll do some initial bench work to see if the, the defibrillator can you know, deliver the shock or do whatever it is it's supposed to do. Then after the results of that initial work, we sort of take a pause, we look at the information, and we try to figure out what is the next step in development. So for example, after phase one, we may have some idea of what range of doses appear to be tolerable by the patients. And we carry that range of doses into the next phase of development. So all the analysis of decisions occur after that initial work. And we try to figure out what the next stage or phase of development ought to look like. Similarly, in drug development, in phase two, we try to find the right dose to carry forward. We try to identify an outcome that appears to be important. We try to figure out whether the patient population is one that will respond. And we, have, we take this initial evidence of efficacy, and we try to confirm it in a certain, an additional phase. Now, amazingly, there's commonly a process in phase two where we use one set of outcomes. Uh, some sort of proximate measure of disability or, or pain or whatever it is we're trying to affect. And yet, it's not an outcome which the regulatory bodies believe is, is solid enough and patient-centered enough to warrant authority to market the drug. And so we actually change what the outcome is in phase three. And we magically assume that measuring one outcome in phase two will tell us whether the drug is going to positively affect a, a different outcome in phase three. That strategy and lots of other components of our current strategy has led to a rate of failure in phase three clinical trials of over 50% across all therapeutic areas. And in some therapeutic areas that are particularly challenging, like sepsis, neurologic disease, 
failure rates that are much, much higher. In fact, I think you can make a good argument that there has never been a successful phase three trial in sepsis. Okay? There's been one that's positive. It was not successful because it probably had got the wrong answer. Okay. So the motivation for an adaptive approach is that once we start to run a clinical trial and some of the initial outcomes of our enrolled patients are known, that gives us some partial information that would have been useful when we were designing the trial. We get a little information about what the right dose is, what the right outcome is, what the right patient population is, et cetera. And we want to use that information which accumulates to modify key clinical trial parameters within this single clinical trial according to some pre-specified, predefined rules. So the idea is we didn't know enough when we designed the trial. We're going to learn continually, and we're actually going to improve our trial design as we go, or at least improve our trial characteristics. And obviously, I'm going to get much more specific. So when I talk about an adaptation, I'm talking about making planned, well-defined changes in key clinical trial characteristics or parameters during the trial execution and in response to the information accumulating within the trial itself to achieve goals of validity, scientific efficiency, and safety. The term planned here means we're going to define everything a priori. These are pre-specified designs. We have criteria that are written down ahead of time for when we would make various changes, so very specific rules. And we're talking about changing major characteristics of the trial, like the number of treatment arms, the number of doses, the inclusion criteria, the sample size, not minor things. And we want to do this in a way that at the end of the trial, we can make valid statistical inferences regarding the relative effectiveness of the treatments or the diagnostic accuracies of the tests or whatever. Now, just out of curiosity, I don't know if you're going to be willing to do this, but how many of the audience in this group find this concept disturbing because it, it's different than what you were taught? Okay, so half of you aren't willing to tell the truth. Okay, okay. That, so we all learn different things from these interactions. That's what I learned. Okay. So uh, this is a cartoon that's published in JAM in 2006 that illustrates the basic concept that the, in an adaptive trial, the data act, that actually accumulate within the trial direct the path from the beginning of the trial, up here at the top shown by the horizontal oval, through different paths which may lead to different termination points for the trial. So it's the data within the trial itself that actually tell us what direction to go in the design. Now, this whole philosophy, it seems like a relatively simple concept, it's sort of a continual learning concept. This philosophy fundamentally changes the types of interactions and discussions that occur during clinical trial design. So for example, it leads to greater clarity of goals regarding uh, what you're trying to achieve in your trial. For example, early on in phase two, you may be trying to just show that there's some evidence of efficacy, so-called proof of concept. The drug affects the biomarker we think that it most proximately uh, should influence versus identification of a dose to carry forward. Do I know the right dose to take into the next stage? Versus perhaps confirming benefit that has been preliminarily excuse me, uh, identified in an earlier phase trial. Those are all very different things, and they different trial designs should be used to achieve each of those goals. I would submit to you that a statistically significant p-value is never the goal of a trial. And the reason I say that is because there are so many ways and there is so much experience with uh, trials in which a statistically significant p-value is achieved and yet you just don't know enough to know what you should do next. Okay? And that's why those trials don't influence clinical uh, practice very much or are often have to be repeated before you can get to the next phase. Do, it's very common in drug development to do a phase two trial have it be positive, and then have the company decide they need to do another phase two because they actually don't know whether they should go to phase three. That means that was not a well-designed phase two trial. Another philosophical difference is we're going to take frequent looks at the accumulating data, usually in an unblinded way, in order to learn as quickly as possible from the information. 
We're going to be talking about trials that are adaptive by design, meaning by the time we enroll the first patient, we know exactly what we would do if various things happen. And because these designs are inherently more complex than the kinds of trial designs you're used to reading about, we can't just write down based on some formula or look up in some table what their characteristics are. We can't look up a type 1 error rate or a false positive error rate under the hypothesis that there's no effect. Nor can we just write down what the power is or what the right sample size would be. So in order to design the trials, we have to be able to numerically simulate them, basically create virtual trials that we can run thousands and thousands of times, figure out what they do well, what they don't do well, and then modify the trials until we get the kinds of performance that appropriately balances the resources we have um, versus the goals and what we are trying to achieve with the trial. So this is another way of looking at an adaptive design. And I just want to run this through you so you get an idea of, of what's going on. So at the very beginning of an adaptive trial, you don't have any information that you didn't have when you were designing the trial. There's nothing to learn from yet. So we always begin these trials with what we call a burn-in period, during which we apply absolutely traditional randomization rules. So for example, I'm going to show you a design that has a control arm and three active treatment arms. So we start during the burn-in with randomly allocating patients across those four arms in just equal probability randomization. And at that time, we may pay particular attention to stratified randomization to minimize the imbalance of covariates across the four groups. And we'll do that for some period of time that's determined by the so-called sampling rule. So for example, if we put 10 patients on each of the four arms, we would do that for the first 40 patients. Once 40 patients are enrolled, we look at the current data. Now this is a very small data set. There's going to be lots of noise in the data. There's going to be some missing outcomes because some patients were just enrolled and we haven't followed them out yet to their outcome. But we look at whatever information we have, imperfect though it may be. And we ask two, the first question is, is there a reason to stop the trial? Is there overwhelming evidence of harm, overwhelming evidence of futility, overwhelming evidence of success that's, that suggests we should stop immediately, based again on three specified rules? Usually there wouldn't be so very early on. So at this point, we look at the data from those first 40 patients, and we say, based on this, should we update our allocation rules? So instead of using equal randomization, maybe we should preferentially randomize a little bit towards the arm that looks a little bit better than the others. We then apply that rule, continue the data collection to the next interim analysis, and again, look at the data. And we continue this in a circular fashion, so it's a cycle where it's continually redesigning itself, if you will, until we meet one of the pre-specified stopping rules, one of which is always that we've reached the maximum allowable sample size for the trial. But in this way, the trial design is continually updating itself. So why would we want to go to all this trouble? So uh, there's a cartoon from the New Yorker magazine. Uh, and there's a couple of things I find interesting in it, but the point I'm going to point out, the thing I'm going to point out. There will be foot testing today in dining room three until 2.30 p.m. There will be foot testing today in dining room three until 3.30 today. There will be foot testing today in dining room three until 2.30 My last fit test, the person said, have you gained weight? And I said, no. He said, OK. <laughs> I hope your fit testing is better than our fit testing. Um, so the cartoonist here seems to be implying that it's bad to be in the placebo group. right? It's like this preconceived notion that that's bad. And it happened, that's what happened to poor Mr. Dudson. But in fact, experience has shown that it's very often really good to be in the placebo group. There are many clinical trials for whom that's exactly the group you want to be in. Because you get in the placebo group, and people care about you. They follow you. They pay much better attention to your medical care. And they don't give you anything dangerous and ineffective. Okay, And so the point here is when we start a clinical trial, the reason we're doing the trial is we don't know which arm is better to be in 
So we shouldn't design trials assuming that we know or assuming that we won't gain information along the way regarding the relative, relative efficacy of the treatments. Okay. Another reason to do adaptive trial designs and the promise of them is that they increase the chance that we get the right answer. We avoid getting the wrong answer. And when I talk about getting the wrong answer, I mean drawing an, indirect, an incorrect qualitative conclusion, concluding that a treatment doesn't work when it has a clinically important benefit or that it does work when it does not have a clinically important benefit. Or alternatively, we want to avoid taking too long to get to the right answer, enrolling too many patients, taking too much time, exposing too many people to ineffective treatments, or requiring another trial when, in fact, we should have been able to answer the question with a single trial. Now, very often when I work with uh, clinical investigators initially in this area, and they come to me, they have frankly been conditioned by their statistical consultants, and I'm looking at the row there that raised their hands, and they've been conditioned the following way. They, they come in and they say, well, we want to do this trial of this drug. Um, only a little work has been done. And I say, well, what dose are we going to use? And they say, two milligrams. I say, wow, how did you know that it's two milligrams? Well, that's the dose. And I say, okay, well, let's, let's just assume for a second that we run the trial, two milligrams versus placebo, and at the very end of the trial, you get a hint of efficacy, but you don't meet your pre-specified endpoint, so it's a failed trial. Didn't give you a clear yes, didn't give you a clear no. What would you anticipate you would regret about the design decision? They say, oh, I wish I'd used four milligrams. I say, well, but you just told me two milligrams was the dose. Well, yes, that's the dose I have to use. I have to pick one, right? But you already know what you wish you had taken over if you had a second crack at, at the trial. Those areas that, that the clinician scientists can anticipate as being their areas of design decision regret are the promising areas for adaptation. For example, in that case, you might naturally want to start with two milligrams because maybe there isn't good safety data on four milligrams. But if the trial is trending towards futility, you immediately start randomizing to the four milligrams, but only if the initial safety data on two milligram are sufficiently promising. Okay? So you automatically adapt to do what a reasonable scientist would do, but only in the situation in which the two milligram trial was trending towards futility. If you do that in a pre-specified way, you can simulate it and you can control the type 1 error risk just as rigorously as in a traditional trial design. So I'm going to drop into history here. I last gave this talk um, uh, in Europe, so I tried to use one European uh, analogy. So we'll talk about the Maginot Line. So the Maginot Line, as you, you all know, because I'll bet your history education is better than that in the U.S., um, was a set of concrete fortifications that were erected between, by France, between France and Germany after World War I. So the idea was the Germans had invaded France in World War I. They used a particular route, and they had a bunch of tanks. So let's put up a set of concrete barriers in that route that they used. Okay? And at the time, there are some wonderful articles that you can still find, um, mostly in French, uh, in which people talked about what a brilliant idea this was. And then in World War II, the Germans just drove around that line and conquered France, I think in three days. I may be off by 12 or 14 hours on that, but not by much. Okay? And there's this saying that generals always fight the last war, especially if they've won it. Notice that implies they actually fight the last war even if they lost it, okay? which is what the Maginot Line is an example of. Why on earth am I bringing this up? I'm bringing this up because the statistical community has learned over the years that there are particular threats to the validity of a trial that they can control, that we can control. We can control the, the likelihood of imbalance of unmeasured covariates by applying randomization. Therefore, strict randomization has become this, this cornerstone of clinical trial design. I'm not saying it shouldn't be. But you've got to understand where it came from. The reason that we keep our clinical trial design static is because it allows us to rigorously calculate type 1 error risk as if the type 1 error risk was the most important thing. But this strategy where we can protect ourselves against those threats has opened us up to, making, to running lots of trials that fail to give us clear answers, 
or give us negative answers that we ultimately think are probably were not correct. And so we have to be more honest with ourselves about the true threats to the success of the biomedical research enterprise, just like in military uh, planning, you don't want to just fight the last war, but try to figure out what your current uh, most pertinent and proximate threat is. So it's tempting to design protections from the minor threats like covariate imbalance with very familiar solutions like randomization and then completely ignore things that are much harder but are much bigger threats to our success like our tendency to change endpoints between phase two and phase three and pretend that we knew something about the phase three endpoint. Um, or design trials with 80% power. So when you design a trial with 80% power, you're accepting that there's a 20% probability that even if the drug works exactly the way you hope, which is always better than it really is likely to, that you're going to take a 20% risk of missing that treatment effect, right? Okay. How often do you take a 20% risk of blowing $10 million as it's totally okay because everybody else does it, and then ignore um, I'm sorry, and then put all your effort into preventing a covariate imbalance that in a trial of 1,000 patients is extraordinarily unlikely to happen. So I'm just saying we don't quantify what the true risks to success are, and we build Maginot lines that we have in sort of a quasi-religious um, beliefs about based on history. So traditional and well-accepted approaches that you see all the time are in fact not very good. If you actually evaluate them, they're not very good. I'll give you just a, a standard example. Phase one dose finding. How many people have heard of the three plus three design? Okay. Any idea how likely that design is to get you the right dose? It's about 40%. It's horrible. And yet, because it's been well published, I still have people suggest that that's what we ought to do. And there's lots of examples like that. So, as I'm making this point that there are other threats to the success of trials we ought to pay attention to, I need to make the point that you can't just look at a particular trial situation and know what the most important threats are. You actually have to be able to simulate the trial and through the results of the simulation, find out what the most important threats are and then design your trial to address those threats. Okay. So I've already talked about the fact that historically, we believed we had to keep our clinical trial designs fixed in order to obtain reliable and valid results. And that's really because it allowed the closed form writing down of our distributions. And therefore, we could say we, we had some strong belief we knew what the type 1 error rate or the power was. This became a culture of biostatistics. And I believe that there are many very good statisticians who don't really know why it bothers them that much when you change clinical trial designs partway. They just know it bothers them. And it's because they've heard this so many times, it's become part of our subconscious. There are some good reasons why we might want to use a fixed trial design. They're, you don't have to defend them very much. They are relatively well understood. They are easier to execute. And if you're in a situation where the, the disease population is likely to change over time, there's a threat in an adaptive design of using data from those early patients to choose a dose that may not be the right dose for patients later on. Okay, so there is a particular threat there. These things happen much less commonly than sometimes people worry about them. So when is this useful? It's useful when there's some information, a biomarker or an early outcome, that's available early enough so that you can learn in time to change something about the trial. So it has to be something actually that you can learn from. There, it, this is more complicated, so you should be working in a setting where there's substantial morbidity, risks, or costs. There should be large uncertainty regarding the right population or dose, although that's almost always true. It has to be practical, and you need to be able to secure the buy-in of stakeholders. I will say that this is an area in which there's been extraordinarily good buy-in in, in the industrial setting, in the for-profit setting. There is rapidly becoming very good buy-in um, at the regulatory setting. And the last group to, to buy into the rigorous application of these approaches are traditional academic statisticians. Okay. So why not do this? It's harder. You usually need to use simulation in order to figure out whether your trial design is any good, and I'm going to give you an example of that. Very few statisticians learn to do this in graduate school. If you went to a traditional biostatistics PhD program, you were not taught how to do this. 
You were taught to program in SAS. You were not taught to program in the kinds of languages that, were, um, that are required to do this, although in some settings this is taught more commonly. So there's some training issues where we have to, um, just like any kind of innovation in a field, we need to make sure our workforce has the time uh, and the resources necessary to gain these skills. And then there are some logistical challenges. If you're going to learn something from the incoming data stream, you need to be able to get those data fast enough to learn from them, although uh, this requires only a small subset of the data. You need to be able to control your clinical trial. If you're varying the randomization ratios across 20 sites, you need to be, have a centralized randomization system. And if you're changing drug doses, you have to be able to change the availability of the doses in the sites in a way so that when a patient is randomized to a dose, it's actually possible to give them uh, that dose. So those are all logistical issues. So as a general rule, the kinds of innovative adaptive designs we're talking about differ from traditional designs in a set of, of ways that we've labeled here as components. This is not to imply that an adaptive design always uses everything in the right-hand column, but this gives you the sort of typical things that helps you tell the difference. So in general, an adaptive design makes more use of frequent interim more use of interim analyses. The randomization ratios are much more likely to be continuously variable. We, it's generally has a larger number of treatment arms or doses. We actually generally use multiple imputation as a strategy for getting the maximum information even in the setting of missing data during interim analyses as, only, as opposed to only at the final analysis. The underlying statistical framework can be either Bayesian or frequentist, but it's much more likely to be Bayesian. And I will say as a caveat that whereas there's actually nothing I'm going to talk about today that you couldn't in principle do from a frequentist standpoint, it is so hard that no one does it. Um, and so virtually all of the innovative trial design that's being done in, in the industry setting right now that, that incorporates many of the things I'm talking about, use the Bayesian machinery as the underlying framework, but we always simulate the trial designs to determine the true frequentist characteristics, your traditional type 1 error rate, your traditional power, so we fully understand the frequentist characteristics of the designs. Sometimes we refer to this as Bayesian under the hood, so it's, it's, there's a Bayesian machinery, but you don't, you don't even have to know that in order to understand whether you think it's a good or not a good trial design. And then again, we use simulation to evaluate them. Now, there is a, a set of adaptive strategies, and I'm going to talk about a subset of them. But um, one of them I want to talk about uh, is explicit longitudinal modeling, the second bullet here. And then I'm going to talk about responsive adaptive randomization and some decision rules and dose response modeling. Okay. So in longitudinal modeling, we take advantage of the fact that we often have outcomes for a patient that are available early on that give us information about future outcomes that have not yet been observed. But this is not the use of a surrogate. We're not, this is not last observation carried forward or anything dumb like that. It's it's using the fact that something is informative. So we do a lot of work in stroke, and the, the uh, endpoint we usually worry about in stroke is a modified Rankin score, so I think it's a six-level ordinal score, um, at six, six months or a year when the neurologic status is stabilized. The worst Rankin score is death, is associated with death. We also get a Rankin score at one month. There are very well characterized transition probabilities for what your score is at one month and six months. So if you're dead at one month, we actually know what your outcome is going to be at six months. That one is really very reliable. Okay? If you have a Rankin score of one, which is just minimal disability at one month, there's a very good chance you'll end up with a zero or a one at six months. But it's not perfect because you may die in there from another disease or you may have another stroke. So we know what those transition probabilities are observationally. We do not know what they are in any individual trial. So what we do is we design a longitudinal model that learns about that relationship within the trial itself to improve the, the uh, precision of the estimates of the outcomes when we're doing multiple imputation. So it's not surrogates. You're not assuming there's a relationship but you put in a structure that allows the trial to learn if that relationship is good. So if you have a bunch of patients who have one-month Rankin scores available but, but not six months, 
you can still use those data to make better interim decisions. Now, sometimes we put in hard rules, like if you're dead at one month, you're going to still be dead. But that one is relatively non-controversial. OK. Response adaptive randomization is the concept of randomizing patients in some way that improves the efficiency or ethics of the trial. And a typical way we do it is to randomize patients to active treatment arms proportional to the probability that each arm is the best arm. So if there's a 60% chance that one arm is the best active arm and the other one is there's a 40%, the randomization ratio between the active arms will be 60-40. We commonly have a constant allocation to the control or placebo arm, so we always have contemporary controls throughout the trial, and that helps protect us from drift over time in the trial population. The decision rules that we use to stop a trial at an interim analysis have a number of um, characteristics you may not normally think about. So in a traditional group sequential design, an O'Brien Fleming uh, design, there's a decision rule that says if at an interim analysis you calculate a p-value and it's less than the, the predefined cutoff for that interim analysis, the recommendation is to stop the trial. Okay, you guys feel pretty comfortable with that? Okay, just out of curiosity, the last trial you saw that had an O'Brien Fleming design, did you have any idea what you were going to do with the patients who had been enrolled and treated but whose outcomes were not known and you crossed the threshold? So how many people think that when that happens and you follow those other patients out to their final outcomes, you should A, ignore them because you already stopped the trial, B, report them, Okay, one person for reporting. Okay, so, okay. So Jim, you rose your hand. So if you report them, what do you do if after you calculate the p-value at the end, it falls back across the threshold, and now it looks like you shouldn't have stopped? You're in deep water. You're in deep water. Nicely chosen use of words. Okay, um, okay. You're in deep water. I don't actually care what the answer is because you can model the trial either way and simulate it and understand its performance. My point is that if you haven't simulated it, you're pro you often will not realize you have to write that down ahead of time for the design to be completely pre-specified. As an aside, I'll make the point that when you cross a threshold, you're stopping the trial based on an extreme value. So there is naturally a regression to the mean that tends to take you back in the other direction over the boundary. So it's not just random bad luck. It's actually an expected characteristic of any event that's selected based on extreme, uh, selecting an extreme value. So when we do decision rules for stopping, we generally do predictive probabilities where we ask the question, if we stop the trial today and calculate the probability of having a trial success once all the currently enrolled patients are followed to their final endpoint, what is that number? And if that number is higher than some particular probability, 98%, for example, then we stop the trial. But it's based on explicitly calculating the predictive probability of trial success following the current patients out to, to their final endpoints, not based on the currently known endpoints directly or in isolation. Okay. The last general thing I want to talk about before I get into the, some of the specifics is dose response modeling. So suppose you're doing a dose finding study. And the uh, drug, uh, you're exploring a five-fold range in doses, one, two, three, four, and five milligrams. And you get data in which the three milligram dose is, is worse than all the others. It's worse than one, it's worse than two, it's worse than four, it's worse than five. Okay? What would you think looking at that data set? I should have a slide of that. You'd look at it and you'd say, wow, we really got extra sick patients on three. It's a fluke. I don't believe it, right? I hope that's what you think because that's probably the only rational explanation for it, okay? When you do that, what you're doing subconsciously <clears throat> excuse me, is you are borrowing strength or evidence from the neighbors. You're looking at two and you're looking at four and saying, I can't really think of a good reason why three would be the outlier and low. And therefore, I don't really believe it. So a dose-response model objectifies that, which is actually very sound logic, 
and reduces the uncertainty in the estimates of the dose response at intermediate doses by looking at the behavior of adjacent doses. But when it does that, it has to allow for the possibility that you'll have an inverted U-shaped dose response curve and that one in the middle might be the best. But you don't want it to be crazy best and you don't want to have a shape of a dose response curve that goes up, down, up, down because that just doesn't make biological sense. So it captures that. Okay. So let's talk about this trial which incorporates those things. So this is a clinical trial of L-carnitine and sepsis. So the clinical setting is adult patients with severe sepsis and septic shock. And actually, we pick a subset of those that have a very high predicted mortality, around 40%. It's a phase two dose-finding trial, so we know we don't know the right dose, of an amino acid L-carnitine that is thought to have the potential to improve end organ function and therefore survival in this patient population. The goals of the trial are to find the best dose and just as importantly to determine whether or not it makes sense to carry that dose forward into a confirmatory phase three trial. So if you find the best dose but you don't know whether it's good enough to do a phase three trial, that's not really very useful. And we want to try to preferentially enroll more patients to the doses we end up being most interested in even though we don't know which dose that is a priori for two reasons. One, so we get the best precision of our treatment estimate for the dose we actually care about. And just as importantly, so we get the most safety data on the dose we're actually going to want to carry forward. Because another way phase three trials fail is you move forward with a dose and it probably had a good efficacy signal, but it turns out to be not tolerable in the patient population. Okay. So, L-carnitine uh, works in the uh, energy transduction part of the mitochondria, and there is a deficit in L-carnitine in patients with severe sepsis, and in animal models with severe sepsis, leads to multi-system organ failure, we think. Um, and multi-organ system failure can be quantified roughly by something called a, a uh, sequential organ failure assessment score, or SOFA score. And it's a key predictor of mortality. So if you come in with a high SOFA score, you're much more likely to die than if you come in with a low SOFA score. But the change in SOFA score over 48 hours, because it's a measure of how sick you are, is a, is a good predictor of how well you're going to do. Because if the SOFA score started high but is getting better over 48 hours, you're improving. And if it gets worse over 40 hours, you're getting sicker despite medical therapy, and your chance of dying goes way up. But even if L-carnitine was effective in changing the SOFA score, it's not going to be approved as a treatment for sepsis, and certainly not in the U.S., unless you can show that you can change all-cause mortality. And the standard FDA endpoint for sepsis drugs is 28-day all-cause mortality. So in phase two, we're just trying to find the right dose and whether we should move forward. We already want to have our eye on the end prize, which is, does this drug look like it might be beneficial in affecting the registration endpoint that could lead to clinical use? Because ultimately, the goal is to identify drugs that can be effective in clinical use. So we have this proximate outcome measure, which is the change of SOFA score over 48 hours. What we really care about is survival to 28 days. We're going to have four arms. Um, you could get, this is an amino acid. You actually give grams of the stuff intravenously. So 0, 6, 12, and 18 grams. We have a maximum sample size of 250 subjects, which was a, fi a fiscal limitation from the funding agency. And we're going to do an interim analysis first at 40 patients. So the first 40 patients is the burn-in. We have equal randomization up to then. And then after every 12 patients, which is um, uh, something like every month. And we're going to use the following adaptive features. First, we are going to randomize patients according to the probability that each dose in the active arms results in the best improvement in SOFA score. So we think this drug affects energy metabolism that affects end organ failure. So let's find the dose that has the best effect on that. That's how we're going to choose which dose to use. But we know that that's not the end game. So what we're going to try to do in determining whether this phase two trial was successful or not is we're going to ask the question, for whichever dose appears most effective, could it win in a future 
independent phase three trial that used 28-day mortality as the registration endpoint. And we just assume that that phase three trial is a traditional one-to-one -one randomized trial with 1,000 patients in each group. If it looks during the phase two trial that none of the doses are sufficiently promising to have a high likelihood of success in a phase three trial, we stop for futility. Now, that may seem like a very simple sentence, but it's, it's really quite um, distinct in most strategies. Our definition of futility in phase two dose finding is based on predicted probability of success in a trial that we're not even running. Does that make sense? Okay, so you're keeping a, your eye on the end game. Our, our early criteria for success is similar. Have we identified a dose that if we stop today and launch a new phase three trial has a high enough chance of success in that independent phase three trial? Now, in order to evaluate this trial design, and there's no, at this point, there should be no way for you to look at this and have any idea if this is crazy or not. But in order to simulate and determine whether it's crazy and its performance characteristics, we have to be able to simulate virtual patients, run them through the trials, see what it would do when we apply these predefined rules, and simulate tens of thousands of trials under various assumptions regarding how the drug might work. And we look at all of those simulated results to try to figure out if this is a good trial design or maybe not so good a trial design. Okay. To simulate those patients, we have to assume some relationship between the change in SOFA score at 48 hours and mortality. So we used an observational data set of real adult sepsis patients in whom we had the SOFA score and mortality to see what the observed relationship was. Okay. So this is a, a typical set, although this is very simplified, of simulation results. So we're going to focus on two different columns. The first column is the null effect column, where we assume the drug's a total dud. It has no effect on the change in SOFA. This is a change from the average change. So zero is, is it's normalized to zero. And it has no effect on mortality. So this is the scenario under which you evaluate the type 1 or false positive rate for the trial. The mild effect is one in which there is an, an increasing dose response. So this is just some assumptions. We're just making guesses of what might happen. And obviously, you'd want to make lots of different guesses to make sure the trial design is OK, regardless of what the truth is. But we're assuming this is the truth, where the highest dose reduces the average SOFA by 2, and that that's associated with a pretty sizable decrease in mortality. Now, people who work in sepsis will look at this and say that's an unrealistically large treatment effect size to assume. Um, this, this was essentially an exercise of seeing what's the maximum information we could get out of 250 patients. Okay? So when you, when you simulate 10,000 trials under those assumptions regarding what the drug actually does, this is what you see. So under the null column, where there's no treatment effect at all, there's a 4.3% chance that the trial blows it and falsely concludes that one of the doses is worth further investigation, even when clearly none of them are, because the simulation assumes none of them are. So that's your false positive rate. So that's your type 1 error. When it does stop early, 43% of the time it stops early and says futility. That's a correct decision, because the drug doesn't work. About 2.3% of the type, it stops early for success. That's a false positive. That 2.3 is included in this um, uh, 4.3. On average, it takes about 200 patients. Okay? When it does falsely conclude that the drug works, it randomly picks one of the three doses because it's just getting fooled by noise in the data. So about a third of the time, it picks the 18-gram dose. That's not really that important here. Okay? So this only demonstrates adequate performance in the null case where there's no treatment effect if you think this is adequate protection against a false positive or type 1 error. In a phase 2 setting, this is actually pretty good type 1 error control. Okay? This would not be OK in a phase 3 setting where this would have to be less than 2.5% by convention. Under the mild effect scenario, where we assume that there's this kind of treatment effect, there's a 91% chance of the trial concluding that the drug is worth further investigation and identifying a dose to carry forward. It stops very rarely for futility, and 68% of the time, it stops early for success. So you don't use your full 250 patients. 
So a characteristic of adaptive design based on these predictive probabilities at, at interim analyses is that you only use the full number of patients when you need to because the actual data you're seeing are ambiguous. If the data are clearly established what you should do, then you stop early and do that. The average required sample size is 172 patients, but some of the simulated trials went fully to 250. And there's a 99% probability that at the end of the trial, when it picks a dose, it will pick the 18 gram dose. So it has a very high accuracy of being able to pick the 18 gram as opposed to the 12 gram. Okay? So we showed the investigator team lots of simulations like this, and we played with internal parameters I haven't told you about, like the thresholds for declaring early success and early futility, to balance the false positive rate against the false negative rate. Okay. She told me if she runs, that means there's a problem. Okay. <laughs> Okay, okay. So what about this concept that the clinical trial this way should result in better treatment of patients within the trial? So under the assumption that there's no treatment effect at all, the trial keeps about a third of the patients on the control arm, equally spreads patients roughly across the other arms, and this is just noise. It, it treats everybody equally, but since all the, all the arms have the same effect, no one gets hurt, no one gets, bene no one gets benefit either, either harm or benefit. In the case where the 18 gram dose is the best, about 30% of the patients end up on the control. Remember I said we, ca we carry a constant fraction of the control randomization throughout to protect ourselves against secular trends. That's necessary to come up with an, a clear decision regarding whether there's evidence of benefit. But among the patients randomized to the, to the active arms, Fully, the majority of those and almost half of all of the patients end up the, with the dose that was ultimately turned out to be most effective, even though we didn't know which dose that was going to be when we ran the trial. So we knew which dose it was because we did the simulations, right? We programmed that as being the most effective, but the design didn't know it. So if we had instead put it a scenario where the 12 gram dose was the best and the 18 gram dose was the worst, You'd see something different here, and, ho and what you would see is that more patients end up on the 12 gram dose than on the 18 gram dose. Okay? So the, the point here is that we end up with almost half the patients on the dose we're most interested in, just like we had done one to one randomization and never consider considered 6 or 12 grams. But we did so while also being able to consider the possibility that the 6 gram dose was the best or the 12 gram dose was the best. So we learn more from the trial this way than we would have with a traditional design. I can tell you that when we first talked to the investigator, they didn't want to consider an 18 gram dose because it just seemed high based on uh, some of the other data that were available. And they wanted the possibility that the 12 gram dose would be the best. This allows them to explore that. And then we said, if it doesn't work, do you wish you'd try a higher dose? And they said, well, of course. Um, so this trial gets the both, best, of both, best of both worlds in that sense. Uh, this complete trial design uh, is published in um, uh, Critical Care Medicine. It's out on the journal website. I guess it'll be out in paper. I don't know if anybody looks at paper anymore um, in July. So all the details are there. Okay. And this trial was funded by uh, the NIH, the National Institute of General Medical Sciences, which I acknowledge. Um, and it's led by Alan Jones, an emergency physician at the University of Mississippi, and they are currently enrolling patients. We're running this trial. Okay. Okay. So what I'm going to do in the last part here is talk about some success stories. So cherry-picked success stories made to make this look good. Okay, that's the way you should think about it. Simply to address some preconceived notions that I sometimes hear. Sometimes when I'm talking about this. Um, usually not at the time of the lecture, but usually out in the hallway, someone will say, well, you know, the FDA will never accept this, or no good journal would ever publish this stuff. Okay? So these are the, the counter examples just to address those, but it, they illustrate some of the techniques. Okay. So um, this was a device trial uh, that was, uh, the purpose uh, was to um, use a radiofrequency catheter ablation to prevent the recurrence of atrial fibrillation. Now, I want to be very clear. The reason the trial was successful 
is because the device works. Okay, so you could have done a, a really relatively um, unimaginative sort of a plotting trial design with a bunch of patients, and you would have shown the device works. Fundamentally, right, it, it really is up to the device or the drug to have efficacy. But what this, what this trial demonstrated was that you could use the predictive probability of success to figure out how many patients you needed so you didn't spend an extra three years finishing the trial when there was already overwhelming evidence of success. And because we had to randomize patients to either get radiofrequency ablation or medical therapy for their uh, atrial fib, and then follow them out, there is a period of time where you had a bunch of patients who'd been randomized and treated but whose long-term outcomes were not yet known. So we used those predictive probabilities of final trial success to know when we could safely stop enrollment, declare the trial success, and by the way, immediately apply for registration approval while we followed those currently enrolled patients out to their final endpoint and verify that the predictive probability was correct and in fact the trial met its pre-specified endpoints. So this is a way of right-sizing a trial. Sometimes we call this a Goldilocks design because the idea is to get the, the size of the trial just right. It's just right in terms of the actual uh, patients that you see. Now much of that behavior one can get with a traditional group sequential design, except no one ever designs group sequential trials with 12 or 15 interim analyses because it just isn't the philosophy and the way you were taught to do it, right? All the tables go to two to three. I'm exaggerating a little bit, okay? So you can get much of this. And then there's some other things about the way it was designed that improved its efficacy. So this was published in JAMA in, in 2010. This is, my, this is my answer to the question, has it been shown in devices and will a good journal publish it? I think journal, uh, JAMA is a good journal. Uh, um, this is a device trial, an interventional device where you take patients with severe asthma and you do bronchial thermoplasty and then you look at the frequency of severe asthma exacerbations going forward. Very similar design in that as we're following the patients out, we're doing frequent interim analyses and stopping the trial, the, I'm sorry, stopping the enrollment of the trial at a time when we have a very high probability of success but we need to follow all the patients out. Again, a successful trial um, published in the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine. How about drug trials? So those, those were both device trials. So this, this, tri this trial is interesting. Um, this was a, a cardiovascular safety study of testosterone um, uh, for so-called hypoactive uh, sexual desire disorder. And the issue here is that the, uh, there's concern that the treatment results in an increased risk of cardiovascular events in the women who are being treated. So there, is, there was an efficacy study that was ongoing. This is not an efficacy study. This is a study uh, intended to demonstrate that the use of the, of the investigational agent has uh, no more than an acceptable, uh, is associated with no more than an acceptable increase in the risk of cardiovascular events in the target population. Again, it used interim analyses, predicted probabilities of success. It worked well. It demonstrated the drug was safe. Um, and the reason it's important as an example is because it was accepted as a registration trial by the FDA for drugs. So commonly we get this question, will the drug people in the FDA accept these designs? So here's the answer to that. Now, a common thing that comes up in, in monitoring drug trials, I just want to point out to you, is that if a drug is very, very safe, it probably isn't doing anything, okay? So this drug turned out to be very safe. The associated efficacy trial failed to show any benefit whatsoever, and therefore they didn't get registration because it wasn't doing what it was actually intended to do, okay? But, but that comment I just made, if you're ever on data and safety monitoring boards or reviewing safety data for a trial, if you see no safety signal, at the chances that there will be an efficacy signal goes down quite a bit. Okay. I want to end my examples by talking about a, a drug development strategy that was used by Lilly for um, uh, this glucagon-like peptide 1 analog, um, which I'm going to call Dula because it's Dula glutide. And this is a drug that's uh, being investigated 
for diabetes. Uh, and the endpoint uh, is uh, hemoglobin A1C is a marker for glycemic control. But the concern was that it might lead to weight loss, weight gain, excuse me. And actually, paradoxically, it actually seems to yield some weight loss. So in order to figure out what the best dose was, we had to integrate information on hemoglobin A1C and weight into what's called a utility function, where we say if it caused no more than this increase in, in weight, it might be usable. But no matter what it did for hemoglobin A1C, if on average patients gain more than this percent of their body weight, that would be unacceptable. And then it's not an all or none. It was a continuous curve. But basically, we had a mathematical representation that basically asked the question, how desirable was the effect of this drug integrating both its effect on glycemic control and on patient weight? The initial design that they ran, uh, the first one listed here, these are all published, uh, was a seamless phase two, three design where you started with multiple doses and you looked at the ability of the different doses to improve the utility, so both benefit glycemic control and, and minimize or avoid weight gain. And it had the possibility of seamlessly, one of its decision rule was if one or two doses looked good enough, you would seamlessly become a phase three um, confirmatory trial. And it had the possibility of taking one or two doses forward. So if you had one dose that was a clear winner, you'd take that one forward. But if you had two that were running neck and neck, you'd take them both forward. It also had an interesting decision rule that said when it, see, it morphs into a phase three trial automatically based on the pre-specified decision rules, because we know the FDA is going to require two adequate and well-controlled trial, we, Lilly, should automatically launch a second independent phase three trial. Because now this drug is a good enough racehorse that we really ought to bet, um, place a full bet on it. Okay? And so this set of publications illustrates both the seamless phase two, three design, um, the statistical analysis, and uh, some other characteristics about their strategy to, to launch, additional, uh, uh, launch additional studies. If you're interested in drug development, I would suggest you go to clinicaltrials.gov. And I'm using only public available, in, publicly available information in, in putting this together. And simply search on Lilly and this drug. And you can see that in 2008, they started their Seamless 2.3. I think it was in 2008. And then sometime around 2010, suddenly they launched a whole bunch of trials. One can assume, with very good reliability, that that's the moment the Seamless 2.3 crossed its decision threshold and said it's time to launch additional trials. Okay. And they, they are very happy about this. OK. Their accountants are really happy about this. Um, so adaptive clinical trial design fundamentally represents a different way of thinking about how we learn from the incoming stream of information that always exists within clinical trials. There are lots of barriers to the implementation of these kinds of techniques. However, there are some perceived barriers and there are some real barriers. The perceived barriers are that it's not worth the time and effort, but I would submit to you that spending four months to design a trial and a few tens of thousands of dollars on simulation work if it saves you millions of dollars and several years in clinical trial effort, that that's a good bet. There is concern that these are difficult to implement despite a good track record in their implementation, that they won't be published, that the results will be uninterpretable, or that regulators or clinicians will not accept them as valid. All of that is then disproven by um, an increasing body of examples. The real challenge is, and the barriers to the use of these techniques are human factors and organizational factors. There is organizational conservatism. Even within for-profit drug companies, a tendency to want to use a traditional approach because if you fail with a traditional approach, no one points a finger at you. But if you do something innovative and the drug is just a dud, even though it's the drug's fault, people ask you, why did you do something new this time? And they just ask a lot more questions. I have had statisticians say to me, if I do something innovative, because I don't think this drug is very good and it fails, I could lose my job. But if I do the standard thing and it fails, even if it costs many more millions of dollars in an extra year, my job is secure. Okay, that's an, an unfortunate incentive. Um, there are many statisticians and even consultants in drug development and device development who have no experience with adaptive design and are somewhat naturally skeptical of anything that they have no experience with. 
The, the focus I talked about, the Maginot line of a focus on theoretical threats to the success of trials rather than things that trip us up every day. A focus on getting to the next stage. Very often you'll hear people say, I need to get to stage three, to phase three, even if I don't know enough from phase two to know what the right dose is because I get my bonus if I get to phase three. Okay? And then a seeming preference, as I mentioned, to fail in a traditional way rather than an in, use an innovative method that actually increases the chance of success. So in conclusion, the motivation for using these techniques is that there's a high rate of failure and a high cost associated with our traditional approach. Approaches that are completely pre-specified and rigorously evaluated through simulation, so you really understand their characteristics, hold the promise to increase the chance of success for those therapies that truly have some inherent efficacy, and that there is a track record of success of these strategies that's just coming out in the published literature and in the regulatory landscape in both devices and drugs. Thank you very much. Okay. So for the audience here, we have lots of time for questions now. And uh, in front of you, there's a microphone, and there are instructions on how to use it. So if you just raise your hand, I'll recognize you. And then if you just introduce yourself and ask a question. So Roland. Well, yes, I'm a statistician with a self-serving question. Press the button. I did press the button. But then you speak into that. Oh, I have to, you mean I have to sit down? <laughs> All right. Well, I, I must say that I am very sympathetic to uh, the, uh, you know, the ideas that uh, you've been put forward here. Um, I'm just curious. Into this looks like it involves a lot more uh, work for a statistician in course of the trial, whereas in the traditional model, you, you know, you give them the sample size and you go to sleep for several years and then they wake you up for the interim analysis. Uh, uh, have you got any experience in that to, uh, in terms of, you know, manpower requirements? Sure. So the, so the greatest change in the amount of work is actually not during the conduct of the trial. It's the design of the trial. So, you know, if someone comes to you with a traditional trial, they want to do a simple group sequential thing and they've well thought out, uh, or they have some estimates of the expected variance in their endpoint. How long does it really take you to do that design if you have the right uh, package on your computer? I, I usually it takes me about 15 minutes, and then I tell them it took an hour, um, right? <laughs> but it's really very, very simple, right? And I, you can write the statistical analysis. I'm just talking about a traditional uh, clinical trial. Now, I'm not talking about all the verbiage about the secondary endpoints, but just the, the basic structure. These take weeks to several months to design. And the fundamental change in the process is that it becomes a um, sequential, interactive, and iterative collaboration between the statisticians and the clinicians. And I tried to say over and over again that there's no way to just write down one of these designs and have any idea if it's any good. And I've written down my fair share of really duds, real duds. But you simulate them, and you sometimes it's obvious they're duds. And sometimes you're balancing competing priorities, power and false discovery rates, for example, accuracy and dose selection. And you bring those, those initial simulations back to the clinicians or the clinical scientists. And they tell you what they like and they don't like. And very often what appeals to them about the design or disturbs them about the design is not what I would have expected would have done either. And then you take that back and you change the thresholds or you change the dose range that you're, you're experimenting with and you re-simulate the design. And in the meantime, they've been thinking about the feedback they gave you and you get back together again. So we have a, tri a project funded by both the NIH and the FDA where we're doing this kind of clinical trial design, designing adaptive trials for neurologic emergencies, where we actually have social scientists in the background watching our interaction to study what the barriers are, what the issues are in communication, what the learning curve is for the statisticians learning about the clinicians' um, priorities and vice versa. So that's where the real work is. I think, obviously I'm biased here, but I think that that kind of interaction 
is intellectually much more satisfying and ultimately much more productive for the, both the statisticians and the clinicians. Because now the decisions you're making, your design decisions, which are always a trade-off, right, um, are fully informed by a careful, in-depth discussion where the implications of those decisions are shown in the simulations and, they, and people judge them. So if I say to a clinician, you know, I could use O'Brien Fleming here with two or three looks, or, you know, I could use a Pocock, but even Stuart Pocock doesn't use that rule, okay? Um, that question doesn't mean anything. And I could, you know, roughly hand wave about it, but they can't really give me an answer. If I say, if I change the threshold from 0.98 to 0.97, look, I gain this much power, but early on I have these false positives that, that are going to cause you to, to now do another trial you shouldn't do. Is that a good trade-off? This becomes a very informed discussion. Now, um, to actually address some of the content of your, of your question, during the interim analyses, because these are pre-specified, the algorithm is already written. You had to write the algorithm, you had to program it to do the simulations. So now all you're doing is taking that piece of code and putting in the actual data stream from the actual trial to, re to make it do what you simulated it doing 10,000 times. So that is not that much work, assuming you know, your code runs and you, um, you don't find new bugs and you know those things that happen in real life. But it, it, that's not the hard work. It's, it's the, the lead time. And you have to totally you know, talk about paradigm shifts. Telling investigators, you can't come to me a week before the grant is due. Okay? <laughs> you need to come to me six months before the grant is due because we actually have no idea what the design is going to look like until three months into it. That's a complete paradigm shift. Okay. Yes, if this I could just follow up with yeah. a brief editorial comment. I mean, that, that's what I was hoping you would say. And I have to say, and this is for the local audience and indeed people in Canada, we have to find a mechanism for actually funding biostatisticians so that they're rewarded for their efforts. I'm a biostatistician. I have a position in a department of statistics that does not reward me for any of these activities. And because I don't publish in the annals of statistics, I haven't had a, you know, a career progress in, in 10 years. So uh, that just wanted to uh, get that off my chest. Well, I'm, <laughs> we like you, Roland. Yeah. yeah, this, <laughs> yeah. So I just, I just want to say that in this work that we're doing with the NIH, one of the things we're having discussions with about is what are the appropriate funding mechanisms for that kind of design work. And NICHD um, and um, a non-NIH entity called the Maternal and Child Health Bureau have actually funded, for example, believe it or not, a two-year project to design a trial of progesterone in head trauma in children, where we're doing all the simulations, a very complicated trial. So there are entities that are beginning to fund that. And we're also looking at um, putting in infrastructure dollars within our clinical and translational science networks, and again, from an NIH institute, that are earmarked for these kinds of design activities. So I think we're going to start to see some realization that good design work is not two hours and a paragraph that goes into a grant. It's, it's really much more detailed than that. Sorry. So here and then over here. Uh, as you pointed you push out, the it's pushed. It's pushed. Yeah. Um, as you pointed out, neurological uh, trials are challenged, um, and it's not just the dose finding part of that. It's also the outcome selection because we're working with an organ which is <clears throat> doesn't give us nice discrete surrogate outcomes. Um, and one of the big stroke thrombolytic trials was challenged just by choice of a threshold between the MRS scales, for example. So is the ability to do uh, this uh, adaptive design in the choice of an outcome measure fair game as well? Can you be searching where your threshold is for the MRS scale, for example? So um, I'm going to answer your question, then I'm going to try to politely suggest it's, it's not the question you wanted to ask. <laughs> okay. okay? Um, so the answer to your question is that in a confirmatory trial, the FDA and others are very suspicious of any trial, any adaptive identification of the outcome measure. And choosing the threshold for the MRS would be considered equivalent to choosing your outcome. Okay, So it would not fly there. That's my best guess. Obviously, I don't make decisions for the FDA, but I talk to them a lot, and I'm pretty confident. Okay, If you were in a learn phase, you absolutely could do that 
But in general, the approach would be to say you cannot include those phase two patients in the assessment in phase three. You could do something that was, it's called operationally seamless. You continue your trial, but it's not inferentially seamless. You have to consider the phase three patients in isolation only after you have decided what your threshold is for the MRS. Okay, now, for people who aren't familiar with the MRS, it's a six-level ordinal scale. It has all kinds of unfortunate characteristics, like a six, which is death, may or may not be perceived as the worst outcome because a five, it, can you describe a five, is basically a persistent vegetative state? You're, you're totally dependent on others in hospital. Okay, uh, so you, in you're in a hospital and completely <clears throat> dependent. There are some rational adults who believe that a five would be worse for them or their family than a six, okay? There's a lot of controversy um, about this. I, was, I just have to tell you, I was once on a phone call with an FDA reviewer who, pointed out that it, the way the threshold is, a five and a six are the same. And the person said, I'd much rather be a six than a five, and then said, oh, I'm not allowed to say that. That's the politics in the US. <laughs> OK. Um, so to come back to it, so the way um, we, we do a bunch of trials that use MRS. And I think the most promising way to look at MRS is to use a utility function where you uh, assign a value, say you assign 10 points to being a zero, that means you're basically back to your baseline function, zero points to being dead, and some number of points in, in between that that represents the true value of those outcomes to some sort of representative patient population. It turns out there are two patient-based assessments of the clinical utility of MRS levels that are published. There's one in Europe, there's one in the US, which I can share with you. They use different scales, but if you normalize them to the same scale, so they both say dead is zero, and the dots fall almost exactly on top of each other. So there's actually a data-derived utility for the MRS. So for all of the stroke work that we do, we try to convince people that what they should be trying to do is to identify the best treatment, dose, device, strategy, whatever it is, to maximize the expected utility measured by that average over the MRS. And the reason that's helpful is that anytime you dichotomize a multi-level scale, if there's movement only on one side of your cut point, you can't pick that up at all. If all your treatment did is change the ones to zeros, and your cut point is between one and two, that doesn't change your, your dichotomy. You miss it completely. Personally, I would really be interested in a drug if all it did is converted uh, ones, ones to zeros. There's actually a really interesting paradox. You can picture, say, an aggressive approach to, to stroke management that might have the, the fascinating strat a property of, of changing ones to zeros, so taking people who would have had some deficit and giving them no deficit, essentially, but also has some risk of changing fives to sixes. It's called TPA. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And whether or not that's a good trade-off depends on how much value you place on each one of those transitions. And it is much better to use a patient-based utility, which actually represents people's preferences for the various outcome states, in order to quantify that. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last comment is, I, I started the whole talk by talking about the tendency of being forced to make decisions. When someone is asked to design a stroke trial, usually the one thing that they force the investigator to ask is, what's the cut point for the MRS? And you never know what it should be. And so there are some strategies called a sliding dichotomy and other things for analyzing it. But what we really should do is say, we don't know what, what, where in the spectrum of neurologic disability the treatment effect is likely to manifest it. So let's design a trial that will detect it no matter where it turns out to be. And the utility function accomplishes that. OK. Could you identify yourself? And Oh, um, There's a speaker in there. Uh, it's on, but anyway. Um, anyway, I'll just speak loudly. So, for a successful prediction of the outcome, it seems like on the limited number that you obtain and for this adaptive trial, uh, the algorithm is critical, right? I mean, if you have poor algorithm, you could amplify a non-significant result and could potentially give you an outcome that says, something other than what's actual. So during the trial, does the algorithm, do you 
modify it as you go on to make sure that it's actually correct or how do you uh, validate the algorithm that you use to simulate? Sure, to get sure. it's a great question. So first of all, your intuition about the first part is not, is, is opposite from what happens. Let me tell you why. Okay. Okay. Um, I don't mean to be totally, you know, so I'm not trying to pick fights here. Oh, no, okay. no, no. <laughs> but, but, so let's come back to regression to the mean. So regression to the mean is this concept that if you pick an outlier, a treatment arm that just happens by noise to be better than the others, but it's just random fluctuation, that if you, that on average, when you look at it again, the value that you get on average, including the, the prior patients, will have regressed towards the average of all the treatment arms. Okay? So picture the, the dose finding trial, the L-carnitine dose finding trial. Let's suppose that all of the doses work equally, equivalently, meaning once you have a gram, you're good, and there's no difference between 6, 12, and 18. And one of them, just by random fluctuation, looks best at the first interim analysis. What we do is we preferentially randomize to that arm. We end up with a more rapid accrual of experience with that arm, and it regresses to the mean even faster. And then when you do your next interim analysis, the probabilities even out, and you start allocating to the other arms. So essentially what this is, this is the equivalent. I, we sometimes use a, race, a, a horse race analogy. All the arms are racing. If one of the horses gets out in front, we say, okay, you're out in front. Now let's make you run even, you know, see if you can really run that fast even with more people on you. That's not a good analogy because I picture the horse struggling. Okay, but, um, but the idea is you actually accelerate regression to the mean. So here's, here's how we can demonstrate this in simulation, which is, I think, fascinating. If you have a set of decision rules for when the trial is successful, and you do balanced randomization, you'll have some false discovery rate, type 1 error rate. If you turn on response adaptive randomization, so you force the better performing arms to prove it, the overall type 1 error rate goes down without any other change. Okay? Because you're, you're actually being better at forcing the regression to the mean if it's just a fluctuation. Now, if one of the arms actually is better, then you're putting more patients on that arm and you get an increased precision around the estimate of the treatment effect and you prove more quickly that it really is the better arm. So it actually works counter to what you're saying, what you, what you would have guessed. This is why simulation is so important because I just learned that bit about the type 1 error rate going down about six months ago when I did it by clicking the little box that says response adaptive randomization. I said, that's weird, the type 1 error rate went down. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make any sense. Now I'm cherry picking. You know, the error rate should go up. And I talked to one of my colleagues who said, oh, yeah, a few years ago I saw that, and this is why. And we, you, can, you can prove. One, as long as it's explained to you, um, it makes sense. I will make the comment that simulation often does this, where you see behavior you don't expect. You assume you've made a programming error. And then a, a day later, you say, oh, that's why it does that. Um, we do, the, answer, the other part of your question, we do not change the algorithm. The algorithm is pre-specified. But the algorithm always uses the current Bayesian probability estimates. So as the data stream changes, obviously the results of the algorithm change. But the algorithm does not change. Okay. All right. Maybe one last question. Anybody have a last question? The two. Okay. Quick answers and quick questions. Oh, okay. So Charlie and then. So um, I am not aware of any adaptive trials um, getting into meta-analyses. And I'm going to make a guess about why you asked the question. So one of the concerns that's been written about with a trial design, whether adaptive or not, that stops early for efficacy, is that the point estimate for the efficacy is an overestimate of the true treatment effect. And there's um, a group uh, led by um, Bassler, uh, among others, who have published a number of editorials that say, uh, or studies, I should say, um, that say if you look at clinical trials that stop early for success and look at their estimates of the benefit and trials of the same treatments, this is not going to be short, but this is important, okay, that, that do not stop early for success but evaluate the same treatments, 
the estimate of the treatment effect is higher for the ones that start early, and Vassler and others conclude that therefore they give biased estimates. Are you familiar with that work? Okay. Did you participate in any of that work? Good. Okay. It is among the dumbest statistical mistakes you could ever possibly make, and it is an embarrassment to the journal that published it on whose editorial board I participate. Okay? Let me tell you why. Let's suppose you're running a bunch of horses. We're going to stick with horses. And these horses are genetically identical. They've been trained identically. God herself has told you that they all run exactly equally well. Okay? That's, that's, the, that's the hypothetical. If at the end of the day, at the end of the race, excuse me, hopefully it's not a whole day, um, you pick the five horses that finished first and compare their speeds to the five horse horses who finished last, which horses have a higher average speed? It's a dumb question, right? The reason those clinical trials stopped early is because the particular data streams in them suggested a higher benefit. They do, to a small extent, small being the key word, overestimate the true treatment effect. The point that Bachelor totally missed is that the clinical trials that did not stop early for benefit underestimate the true treatment effect. Because the, the horses who just ran slowly that day they underestimate the true performance of that breed of horse. The horses who won that day overestimate the true speed of the horses. So there's a fundamental, fundamental logical error in that, which obviously drives me crazy. Now, just like I made this comment about the needing to quantify threats to validity, the key issue is not whether or not a trial that stops early is biased at all. It's whether is it biased enough to be scientifically, clinically, or ethically important. Okay, so would it bias a review enough in a meta-analysis to change a positive result to negative or vice versa? And when you do uh, studies, which you really have to do through simulation, the amount of bias with the early stopping rules that are commonly in practice is on the order of a percent or two in the magnitude of the, be of the benefit of estimate. It's really small. It's absolutely there. But it is so small that it is a minor threat okay, against the real threats to trial success, like having the wrong endpoint, the wrong population, the wrong dose, et cetera, et cetera. Bias, unblinding, all those things. And so it's, an, it's a perfect example, in my mind, of this Maginot line philosophy, uh, phenomenon where we really worry about something that's not the real threat, while the ethnic group I won't mention is driving around the concrete bunkers. Okay? And so we need to really worry about the right thing. So it's a great question because it ties into a whole area of controversy. But I would just urge you to, if you're familiar with that work, to reread it carefully and read the letters to the editor that were written about that paper and notice who wrote them. To the okay? last question. Sorry, very long answer. I'm sorry. Can you turn your speaker on? Yeah, sure. Uh, okay. It worked before. I'll, I'll turn it to you. Uh, all right. So um, I realized this, this question probably didn't work uh, when I was talking to you. So, but um, yeah, as you mentioned earlier, just why you were presenting and I think hopefully you put the problem with more so it's kind of precise. I think if I were a farmer, uh, drug going, it's going to the next couple of years. Uh, there's more and more development of drugs for uh, orphan diseases, the so called orphan drugs. Uh, and quite often you're faced with extremely uh, um, small patient populations, and you need to do something very innovative before you put the trials in order to actually get the answers. So I know it may be worthwhile than a one hour talk, but I was wondering if you could give a, just a, a quick uh, uh, summary of where you think that the trials might be going in, in terms okay. of orphan, um, orphan drugs. So the, the, the basic philosophy of adaptive trials is try to, to try to make the most efficient use of real information. And clearly, when you're in a severely sample size constrained setting, that's a good philosophy if you can do it. 
The other thing about adaptive trial design that I think is very useful in that setting is it forces you to be honest with yourself about the performance parameters. Because when you do the simulation and your type 1 error rate is, you know, 30%, you just have to, you have to decide to change it or decide that that's what you're going to go with. So some orphan, um, some clinical trials for orphan diseases are, they're sort of designed in a way that they have a, a higher false discovery rate, but they're not really honest with themselves about it. Okay. There's an, uh, the Institute of Medicine from the National Academy of Sciences recently published, maybe the last few years, a study on the orphan and rare disease programs within the United States. And specifically comment on, in several different places, on the use of adaptive designs to accelerate and improve the ability to identify therapies for orphan and rare diseases. Um, and so there's, some, there's a specific place I can point to. The last thing that I'd say has to do with the um, blurring of the line between orphan and non-orphan diseases. So let's take um, lung cancer. Okay? So lung cancer was never thought of as an orphan disease, very common. But tumors vary tremendously in their genetic signatures, the details of their proteomic signatures. And as we learn more and more and more about, for example, cancer biology, but this is true of infections, it's true of lots of things. What we're finding out is almost everybody has an orphan disease. We just didn't know how to tell the difference. And when you group enough people with orphan diseases, it looks like a lot of people get this disease. So there is a, a colleague of mine, a guy named Don Berry, who said, and he works primarily in oncology, and one of his, his themes is that pretty soon every cancer patient will have an orphan disease. And so the question is, how do we design clinical trials that don't cover up that heterogeneity, which is what we do now, right? We hope every lymphoma, B cell lymphoma is the same, okay? Unless the trial doesn't work, then we analyze them and show how, they, how different they were, okay? Um, but instead, from the very beginning, understand that there may be 5, 10, a dozen, 30 subtypes that we can identify through genotyping or other characterization, and to have a trial that efficiently with definable error rates, tries to determine from the very beginning whether there's differential treatment effect within subgroups of a magnitude sufficient to change the enrollment criteria during the trial. So these are something I didn't cover for the interest of time, which is our enrichment designs. In an enrichment design, you start with a, a wide set of inclusion criteria in general. They don't have to be done this way. And as the trial progresses, if it trends towards futility in the larger population, you look at subgroups, you cherry pick, and then you continue the trial only in the subgroups in an attempt to demonstrate treatment effect. Now, most statisticians hate this for several reasons. Number one, you're cherry picking so that it increases your type 1 error risk. The answer to that is you set your threshold for doing this high enough so you get back to the type 1 error risk you originally wanted. And often statisticians um, don't like it because at the, at the end of the trial, you have a period in which you had big inclusion criteria and a period where you had more selective inclusion criteria. So now what population do the results of the trial apply to? Okay? It's, it's really very, very uh, perplexing. So I'll leave you with a story. So um, uh, there is a, a guy who's very influential uh, in the FDA, in the drug branch, who was involved in a, a dinner time, I'll call it a debate. It sounded like an argument, but we'll call it a debate, over with a statistician over whether or not these designs were okay. And the statistician's position was, I don't know which population the benefit is demonstrated in. And the clinical expert in the FDA said, you know, if we've shown that it works in some population, even though it's a mixture, at least we know we've got a drug that works, and all we need to do is write the labeling properly so physicians understand the weakness or the, the characteristics of the data on which that's based. So the idea is it better to stick with your big trial and end up learning nothing and not identifying a beneficial treatment, or is it better to do an enrichment design so at the end you know it works in some population and know it's a little unclear which population that is. And the argument is that that latter situation is better than failing to identify a true treatment effect. Okay. It's a great question. All right. Go ahead and wait All right. Over. Thank you very much. Um, I want to uh, thank everybody for coming today and, and to Dr. Lewis for a very um, 
fascinating talk. Um, Jim want to say something okay. before we close? Yeah, I also want to thank everyone for coming and thank Aslam and Chaos for putting together the lunch and the, uh, the video hookup and just to uh, thank Roger again on behalf of uh, the colleagues that he met and the audience that he stimulated and, and BC Crin. Uh, as I said, this is our first guest lecture, and we're going to continue with this and have some other guest lecture. If you have ideas of, of stimulating speakers and people that can provoke us with new methods and better methods, uh, send me an email. Um, but I also want to personally thank Roger. He's worked very hard. We've uh, driven him uh, through a series of meetings and a stimulating dinner last night with colleagues and all day today. And um, I just want to, uh, on behalf of the audience, thanks for provoking us. So great, great. Thank you very much. Thank you.